This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Transporter, the solution to your cloud storage needs. Get 10% off your Transporter by visiting filetransporter.com slash MV and use the coupon code MACVOICES. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. We've got Ted Landau back on the line to see what he's up to this time. Ted, what are you up to? I'm not up to a heck of a lot, to be honest with you. I'm, uh, as we talked about last time, I'm writing for Macworld, and that's been working out very well. They're keeping me even busier than I think I was before. Well, I was always working for Macworld, but I used to split my time between Macworld and Mac Observer, and I've stopped writing for the Mac Observer, and I thought that might mean that I would uh, be having some more free time, but it's worked out uh, not quite that way. Macworld is happy to keep me busy, and, and I'm happy to be busy, I guess, at some level, or I wouldn't be doing it, so it's fine. Now, you've been writing bugs and fixes for Macworld for a while. What are you doing now? Are you doing just more general articles, or do you have a regular <laughs> column there? Or no, I'm st yeah, yeah, I'm still doing bugs and fixes, and I have done um, three other categories now. I, I've done a, uh, an occasional review, um, the, the big one being the review of, of the snap scan, uh, scan snap, sorry, the scan snap scanner and uh, comparing to the neat scanner that I did a while ago. Uh, I'm doing a series of uh, working Mac articles for, for Shirley Sawyer. Uh, did one on printing that just came out Monday. Did one on uh, something else before then. I'm working on another one on disk repairs uh, that'll be out in a couple of weeks. So that's that's keeping me busy. And, and actually, I started doing some op-ed pieces as well. So I did the one on, uh, on comparing iCloud to Dropbox a couple of weeks ago, and then, and then did the one which I think we talked about on the show last time about uh, can an iPad replace a MacBook or a Mac in general as, as your only computer. Ted, I'm not sure we've ever actually talked to you about the mechanics of your writing. When you sit down and take on a topic, how do you take on a topic? Do you outline it? Do you, do you, yeah, I guess, do you outline it? Or do you have some idea of where it's going to start and where it's going to end? Or do you sort of dive in and, and see where it takes you? Um, I don't know if there's just one way that I do it. But uh, the most common thing that I do is I have an idea in my head. Some, so, somehow or other, either an article that I read on the web or, or a TV story that I saw on the news, or or just a conversation that I'm having, where my sometimes a conversation with you actually, it's occasionally happened where in the course of conversation I say something and I and I say to myself, gee, you know that I've never actually written that out before. That could develop into a good article, and so I have some idea of what a good article idea would be, and uh, I I think about it in my head only at first, uh, and then it's time to put it to paper. And that's the critical moment, because many of these ideas that sound wonderful in my head die on the paper. Uh, as soon as I try to write them, I discover, oh, this is going to take much too long to write, or really, there's nothing there to say that hasn't been said before. Or it just seemed good when I was thinking about it. So, uh, And when I initially write it to paper, typically what I'll do is what I sometimes refer to not very um, pleasantly as vomit mode. Um, where I just tried to transfer without thinking about the style of the article, whatever was in my head, to paper, uh, just to get it down there and, and see, like I said, how it's going to look. And then um, once that's there, uh, then I start working on rewriting it. And um, that is usually the hardest part. Um, I rewrite it both for style and also for research, because often I, you know, w often you say things, uh, and sometimes even on the show, that pass as okay when you're in casual conversation, but when you're writing it uh, for, for an article that you hope is accurate, maybe not. So you might say, well, you know, I'm sure uh, Apple's laptops sell much more than, than whatever, than their Macs or than somebody else's laptops or whatever, and, and everybody nods their heads and says, yeah. But then I, I write that out in an article, and I say, you know, what if that isn't true? You know, do I, I really need to document that, and, and before I make an assertion like that, find out which. And so I spend a lot of time at that point searching through the web and making sure that, that wherever I say something that I believe needs some factual backup to make sure that's true, I, I, I get the backup that's needed and, and wind up adding often a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of links to the article. Uh, and then once that's done, then I go through it a few more times for style. 
uh, uh, because no matter, it, it, this is, you often I, I will wind up actually reading it sort of semi aloud um, to see if it has any sort of conversational style and and any sort of interesting voice to the article beyond just laying out facts there. Um, and uh, and depending on the article, it could actually go quite fast. I mean, sometimes from, from step one to the finished article can be less than a day, and sometimes it can be a week or more. It, it depends upon what we're doing. It, it surprises me that I've never thought to ask that before, mm. and it surprises me to hear that you do that many passes through it, not because it... The articles don't reflect some quality, mm. Mm. but just I think of you as such an organized thinker and and an articulate person here as we have our conversations on on the show. Mm. And so the fact that you go through it so many times interests me a lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. That that there's the idea that 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 your own stuff doesn't need editing is just a total fallacy, <laughs> fantasy, whatever. Um, yeah, I uh, th there isn't an article that I've written that hasn't that hasn't been improved by reading it over, and sometimes it hasn't been improved enough because <laughs> I haven't read it over enough. <laughs> it, it occasionally happens that I post something and I say, "Oh my God, I should have read that over a few more times before it actually got posted." <clears throat> Well, we all do that, I think, to some degree, no, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, no matter how many times I, mm -hmm. I edit a show. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could have tweaked this. Maybe I could have fixed that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, like they say, real products ship at some point. You just got to say, uh, time to, time to set, set it to sail. And you're always your harshest critic. Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. question. Ted, how about, since we're on this topic and at the risk of maybe asking the same question a different way, do you have any particular methodology when it comes to reviewing a product? You just mentioned the, the scan snap and, mm -hmm. and the neat scanner. Do you sit down with a list of of things that you do, or is it sort of an unofficial list in your head, or do you just start to use the product and let uh, the pros and cons? Usually, I start to use the product, and to be to be frank, and or or Ralph or whatever we want to be here. <laughs> um, uh, I don't like doing reviews much anymore for just that reason. Uh, I, you know, I got my start in writing uh, for Mac uh, as a reviewer. Uh, probably the first, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 things I wrote were reviews. And <coughs> so I'm always grateful to them because I probably wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for all the reviews that I wrote. But uh, I've gotten to a point now where they're the least fun things for me to write because a, a good review or one that at least passes my um, criteria for what I find acceptable for me to write, requires an incredible amount of work. If you, because, because here's a, a couple of examples. I mean, one is I'm working with this, with this application and I want to do something and I can't find a way to do it. And it's frustrating me and it's annoying me. And so I say, okay, fine, here's a criticism of the application. I want to do A and there's no way to do it. But then before I actually put that to paper or after I've initially put it to paper, I think, wait a minute, what if there is a way to do it? And I just haven't been able to figure it out. I can just see myself writing an article in which I say a, a feature A doesn't exist and then having 19 people leave comments for me saying, what kind of dope did this review? It's right in the menu bar, in, in, the, in the view menu or whatever. And I just never noticed it. And so then I say, oh, before I say that something doesn't exist, I have to make sure it really doesn't exist. And so I'll go through the help file. I'll do, I'll do searches for it. And uh, I may even contact the developer and say, I've been having trouble finding this feature. Uh, is it anywhere in the program. I'll go online and, 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 and see if other people have complained that the feature doesn't exist and, and, and if they have, see what the responses to those complaints are. Maybe somebody's you know, pointed out where it exists before. Uh, and, and then you have to go through, and for big programs like Microsoft Word, say, or never mind Microsoft Office, for these huge programs like that, I mean, there are hundreds of features. There's no, you can't possibly mention every feature in a review. So then you have to decide um, what, what are the features that you're going to even bother mentioning in a 1,200 or sometimes even less 800 word review for a product that could require 10,000 words for, for every, you know, to even mention every feature. So uh, you wind up spending so much time just going through what the program has and doesn't have that by that point, I, I've lost all interest <laughs> often. So, um, you know, I, I enjoy playing with products, but writing a review of them is a lot more work. Uh, and so, you know, in the last few years, I did very few reviews. Occasionally, I would do something which I 
call like a quick take. You know, I wanted to make it clear that this wasn't a thorough review. This was my first impression, or or something to that effect. Uh, and that was a little bit to get me off the hook of of of, of explaining why I didn't cover a particular feature that somebody thought important or something like that. I, I was just going to say that the listeners probably don't know, but Chuck interrupted the conversation at this point and. And, and canceled the call and called me back. And, and, and during his absence, I said absolutely the most amazing things. But, <laughs> but unfortunately, it wasn't recorded, and we'll never, we'll never know what they were. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm sure they'll come back to you. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they'll come back to you. I, and I guess I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you say that about product reviews. It's, it's a strange thing that seems to be happening. We all want more product reviews, but the trend toward product reviews seems to be getting shorter. There was a time that... A product review could go on for a page and a half or two pages, depending on the product. And now it's two or three paragraphs and a conclusion. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Uh, if you look through, like, Macworld Magazine, um, their reviews are shorter th- than, I think, than they used to be. And again, <laughs> make an assertion like that, and next thing I know, somebody's going to say, well, I actually did a comparison word count, and they're longer now than they used to be. Um, so you know, I feel like I have to go back and do a, do a study before I can make a statement like that. But my impression is that that they're shorter now than they used to be and and less dominating the magazine. Now, if you look at if you look at the, the cover of the magazine and what what they're featuring uh, more often than not it's it's editorials and tips and how to's and uh, product reviews don't seem to be what uh, is is currently you know the, the hot thing and I'm, I'm a little surprised because there's so much competition out there mm. for different products and mm. I guess maybe maybe it's one more trending toward a less technical audience and a more general audience because I, I like to go through and start doing like little checklists of which product has this, which product mm. has that key feature, so that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm making, at least for me, mm. what I think is an informed decision. Well, maybe it's, it, when you know, I'm focusing on the general purpose sites like Macworld, because that's what I work, write for, but maybe part of the answer is that that sort of information is available. It's just not available anymore as much on sites like Macworld. But you can, you can search on the name of a product that just came out and probably find, you know, if it's, if it's some photo um, application, say, so, some iPhoto competitor or something like that, uh, there'll probably be some 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 site that's devoted to photography apps that does nothing but review photography apps. That's their whole purpose of existence, and they're on top of it. Uh, and and then, of course, you can go to Amazon and, and search for the product name and find that there are several several hundred reviews that people have left, often quite detailed. And the, the Amazon reviews are often very impressive. Uh, and so the need to have a general site like Macworld cover something that's going to be covered in various ways all over the web becomes less yeah but there's still that credibility thing Uh, the amazon reviews are great and if you take the time you can sometimes start to learn certain reviews for certain Mm. classes of products they Mm. they make it made it a second career out of reviewing for Mm -hmm. amazon i don't know but Mm. there's still that thing about establishing a relationship with a ted landau or a chris breen the 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 reader writer relationship and having Mm. a certain amount of faith that if ted says this is good then it's probably good. And if Ted says this is really bad, then I want to stay away from it. Yeah, and there is still some of that, especially for new big products like like Apple. You know, especially like when when a new uh, iMac comes out, inevitably you'll see David Pogue and 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 Chris Breen or whoever is doing it for MacWorld and mm-hmm. uh, and all those people who have often been seated with. Uh, the hardware weeks before it came out, uh, coming out with the reviews of what the product is like. Uh, and so that still exists. But for, le- for a lot of products, much less so. Do you think the web has, has fostered a lot of that, Ted? Oh, yeah. Because, as I said, because there's so much more places you can go to seek the information. Back in the days before the Internet, there were like three or four or five, whatever, um, major uh, Mac, uh, Mac print outlets. So there was Mac Week and Mac User and Mac World and Mac Today, maybe, maybe a couple of others, uh, half a dozen, say. And then there were some user group newsletters that were popular, like Bema 
plug and so on. Uh, and that was basically it. I mean, you could go through a dozen sources of information, and you probably had everything that was that was available other than through word of mouth uh, that you could want to know about a product. Uh, and these days, that's not even close to being true. I mean, you go online and search for whatever, the, the, the latest version of Microsoft Office, and there'll be probably several thousand places that talk about it. Yeah. I, I guess I, the access to information, you're mm -hmm. right. I, I hadn't thought about it exactly that way, but mm. you can go, and if a publisher, a vendor, software author, mm. uh, manufacturer, if, if they're smart, they'll make a lot of that stuff accessible mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who like to pour over the specs and mm -hmm. all that, and then, you know, feature sets. And mm. I'm just, I'm glad there's still a place for the opinion pieces mm -hmm. and the credibility. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's been actually speaking of opinion pieces. It's been great having an opportunity to do opinion pieces for MacWorld. That's a, that's a positive shift for them. I think that I wasn't totally aware of until I brought it up. You know, I had done a lot of um, op-ed type stuff for Mac Observer, and when I left the Mac Observer, I went to MacWorld and said said exactly that. I said, you know, is there any opportunity for me to do op-ed stuff for MacWorld? Because I've never never approached them about that before. And they said, sure, we're looking for that now. Uh, and and sure enough, as I started. Going through their homepage every day, looking, you know, checking things out. There, there are several op-ed pieces a week that they're now um, that they're now posting, and it's a very different emphasis for them. And so that's worked out very nicely for me as well. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. I knew you'd find some place. You couldn't just keep all that knowledge and wisdom stored up. Oh yeah, I could. <laughs> yeah. But as it turns out, I, I haven't done that quite yet. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Transporter, the solution to your cloud storage needs. Transporter provides you with a private cloud that you control, but that can be shared with anyone and accessed on any of your iDevices. One of the great things about Transporter is the cost. You know what you're going to pay when you buy, and know that you will have no monthly fees at any time. Share as much data as you like with as many people as you like at a known fixed cost. Your files are online and in the cloud quickly and easily. Just copy what you want to share, photos, documents, whatever, to your transporter, and they are immediately available to your iDevices or to anyone you choose to share them with. Get 10% off your transporter by visiting filetransporter.com MV and use the code MACVOICES. The transporter is available from all your favorite retailers, but you only get the 10% off if you buy from the website. Thanks to Transporter for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Well, let's see if we can tap a little bit of that now. Maybe mm. I, I'd, I'd be interested in gazing into your crystal ball. And here we go with my disclaimer, but we're going to stay away from rumors or and, and all that because 99% mm -hmm. of the time they never come true mm -hmm. and they're more science fiction than anything. But well, I, I, Just a second. I have to make a note of that on my iWatch. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, I don't know that the iWatch is a rumor. It's, it's more maybe the kind of speculation, but mm. that's a good place to start, Ted. I guess, you know, wearable computing. Mm -hmm. is, is it, do you think it's a reality? Do you think it's needed? You know, that's one of those things that I never really pass judgment on until I see the product. My initial response to an iWatch was, oh, my God, uh, that's not what I need. Uh, I already have an iPhone in my pocket and an iPad that I carry around as if it's tethered to my arm, and a MacBook when I want something beyond that. And now people are talking about having an iPad mini and an iPad for when you want the, the ideal size. And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, what, you know, how many different I things am I going to make use of, uh, uh, and and maybe the I you know maybe the answer is that that's not for me. Maybe the I you know maybe not maybe the I watch is for somebody who doesn't want an iPad and thinks that the I watch is the better way to go, so they don't have everything. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Yes, it would be you know, it would be nice in one sense. I, I I'm one of the, what I thought was one of the old school people that actually wore a watch all the time, and, and in fact, it was a digital watch. I loved digital watches, and I never understood how or why digital watches became so unpopular. If you go into a uh, into a jewelry store now and look for watches, for instance, the digital watches will be the sports watches that look ugly as sin typically, and, and are covered with with all sorts of of um, 
uh, indicators as to what the different functions do. And this is your chrono, this is your chronometer, and this is your depth charge releaser, and uh, and and everything else that it's doing. And and it's not very attractive. And if you look at the more attractive watches, they're all analog now. There are no more attractive digital watches. Basically, it's just it's something that didn't fly. Uh, and but I always had the nicest one I could find, and not too expensive. And uh, and then recently, the one I got broke. Uh, and for the first time, I decided not to run out and get another one. And I said, you know, I'm just going to try to survive with my iPhone. Pull my iPhone out of my pocket when I need to know what time it is. And that's not then. That's what my son does. That's what a lot of other people I know do. I said I'd give it a try, and so far it's worked pretty well. I have probably it's been about eight months now since that happened, and I haven't had any great urge to replace my watch. But it's still nice to be able to just flick your wrist when you want to see the the time uh, and uh, and if I could do something else useful besides check the time uh, that would be nice too I just not sure yet because I can't see what it is what that what those useful things are that I would do with an eye watch that I would say why the watch is the best way to do that uh, and then my iPhone's going to wind up staying in my pocket a lot more often now that I have an eye watch on my wrist Ted I I guess, I, I, much to my surprise, when I started thinking about an iWatch, looking at the pebble uh, that is already out there in the wild, and I, I love my iPhone, do, do not misunderstand, but there are times mm. that it would be nice to, to be in a situation where I didn't have to be hearing everybody else's phone ring if it were just vibrating on their wrist uh, mm-hmm. to let them know there's a call. There are times mm-hmm. that in a noisy situation or whatever, I would like to be able to know that I've got a text message or a, a direct message on Twitter or something by a vibration on my wrist that I could glance down and look at as opposed to having to pull the mm-hmm. iPhone out. So mm-hmm. I was surprised that I could even – that I, I could see it. Um, I don't know – I, it's going to be interesting to see if it's ever implemented and how well it could be implemented. But I do think there's a possible use case here. Oh, it's possible. Yeah, I said I have to wait and see. But I certainly wouldn't want it to be something, now that you're mentioning the, the vibration thing, where it is another device that you have to worry about turning off when you go into a movie theater, for example. Because uh, there's enough trouble with the phones. If, if we now have people, especially if they light up, can you imagine if everybody in the movie theater has some sort of eye watch that lights up every time they get a text message? Uh, it'll, look, it'll look like uh, the night sky in the movie theater. So, <clears throat> yeah, well, is, does the pebble uh, does the pebble have a paper white display? Uh, I, I don't, th- I don't recall. Uh, I yeah, haven't I'm, looked at it that much. I'm not sure either. I'm not sure either. Okay, so we started with the eye watch, but how about just any tech in general, and we can we can limit it to Apple or not, as you see fit. Mm. But where where are we going? Well, the Google Glass certainly has made a a large impression in the last couple of weeks, and I've been looking at that, and I you know I think it's quite neat uh, to use a trite word there, one that I would never use in an article I'm writing. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, again, I have my doubts about it. I. I the main thing I have my doubts about is not so much what it does or doesn't do. Right now, I think I tweeted when it first came out that it looks like little more than a than a hands-free camera, uh, which it certainly is. It looks like it could be a very nice one, but it does more than that. It connects with Google. You can search things. You can uh, you can actually, as as I see from some of the promos, it looks like you can actually interact with what's in your environment and, and look at something and say, what is that essentially? Uh, uh, if, at least that's the goal if it isn't already doing that. Uh, and so it can do some useful things besides besides being a camera. I was being a little bit snarky, I guess. But I, there's a part of me that just is uncomfortable with the idea that you're always on. It's bad enough to have an iPhone in your pocket, but but to actually be wearing something that you are never disconnected from the internet, that, that you can be getting messages every second that you're wearing the glasses, uh, and, and that even almost even worse than that is that when you're interacting with somebody, you may not be really there anymore. That you that's, you could be talking to someone who's wearing a Google Glass and you think you're having a conversation with them and actually they're attending to what's on their Google Glass screen. And, uh, you know, again, that can be bad enough uh, when, when you, you know, I've seen situations where people are conversing with each other and staring at their iPhone at the same time. And at some point, someone might get annoyed and say, put the iPhone down and actually look at me when you're talking. Um, my wife has been known to say that, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but um, 
but but so at least, so again, at least you know that there's a source of distraction in there. With with the Google Glass, you don't even know what's going on. I think it it's it. I'm, I'm not sure it's a positive thing in that regard. So, well, social norms have definitely changed in mm -hmm. in regard to the way we use our our personal technology. You're right; it's no longer completely impolite to be having a conversation with someone mm. and glance down at your phone and. You know, see mm -hmm. see what your next recent messages or your Twitter stream, because mm -hmm. I've I've caught myself doing it and think, oh, that's not very polite, and yet nobody seems to be bothered by it, or very few. Mm -hmm. And the younger the person, the less they seem to be bothered by it because that's become mm -hmm. the norm for them. Uh, it's not even become the norm; it's the way it was when they discovered the norms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. And there never was another norm for them to undo. We're old enough that we have to undo a norm. Well, how many people have we have we have you talked to and I talked to parents that don't understand their kids because their kids will be texting instead of calling the way we probably mm. did when we were kids. You know, they they text their friends all the time. They don't call them. Mm. There's mm -hmm. there's no conversation, and it's like, what's wrong with you? Well, you're right. That's mm. what they grew up knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have not. I don't text as much as people half my age do that's that's for sure and nope. people and, and people generally in my age bracket most of them that i know don't text at all so but i i see people that used to say i don't text now they're texting they're they're finding mm. that there's a benefit to that mm. time shift and mm. it's at least in in some circles maybe a little more convenient than email or a little more fa a little mm. faster than email or mm. something i don't know yeah, it has its advantages. I mean, it's less intrusive. Uh, that's when I use it. There are times when I don't want to interrupt somebody by having it be a phone call. And I don't want to, especially when it's likely that if you call, even if you're calling for one thing, you wind up being on the phone for 10 or 15 minutes because you called. And now you're going to, how are you doing? What's going on? All this other stuff. And, and really, all you want to know is... What time does the movie start? And uh, and so you can just say, what time does the movie start in a text message and get, you know, 7.15 as an answer and you're done. It's very efficient. Uh, and uh, the the carrying on a conversation through text messaging, which, which a lot of people do, is something that I've never gotten into, though. Teddy, you were all surprised that FaceTime, Skype video, some of those things have not become just a little more popular. Um, well, I don't know exactly how popular they are. They certainly have their usefulness, and, and we use them. You know, it's 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 great. For, you know, I've often said, maybe even on this show, that that I feel like the future has arrived. I, I'm living in the future in the sense that if I look back on what was science fiction when I was a kid, I think we can do things now that exceed the the wildest dreams of some of the science fiction people from 40, 50 years ago. Uh, the, the idea that I can will see a video of you even though you're on the other end of the country for free anytime I want um, it's just astounding when you think about it uh, <clears throat> and and so, so yeah we we use it uh, you know, when our son who lives in Colorado when we want to see him and his family we will we'll use Skype that way um, <clears throat> and, and that's probably the most common thing that we use it for, but I've used it for other things as well, and I, I think it's, it's great for that. And uh, Anytime you want to show somebody something, you know, sometimes if, if, if you just got some new piece of furniture and you want to show somebody what it looks like, uh, instead of taking a photo of it and text messaging it, you can just get on FaceTime and turn your iPhone towards the object that you want to show, and they're looking at it. So, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's useful for that. I want you to know I just don't video with anybody, Ted. Oh, yeah, well. You know, most, I, won't, I won't say what you're wearing on the air. Yeah, but, thank uh, you. <laughs> most, people, <laughs> most people have to pay for this, Ted. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. It's a, this is a bonus that only the people who actually do these interviews get. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. Okay, so where does Apple fit in all, in all this? Uh, they've been the a driving force, if not the mm -hmm. driving force, in so many of the changes that that we have experienced in the past 10, 15, 20 years, and especially, really, the last five to seven, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you think they can continue to 
I, and I'm not going to start that game changer discussion mm. unless you want to. Mm. Mm. So I'm not going to say can they continue to be the game changers, but can they continue to maintain that leadership role? I, without a doubt, they can. I don't see why they they, they couldn't. Uh, there's just nothing that's different about Apple than there than there was a few years ago. Obviously, Steve Jobs is gone. That's a difference. But I don't think that that's a difference that would account for why they shouldn't be able to continue to innovate in in the way that they have. It may be that we're in a stagnant period now where there just isn't something as spectacular to innovate with as an iPhone and an iPad. It may be another few years before something of that caliber comes along. I, I, you know, I don't think it's the case that you can come up with something that big every two or three years on, on cue. So, uh, and in some ways, it might be a bit unfortunate, speaking of Steve Jobs dying, not uh, I mean, uh, unfortunate timing in a sense that, that you know, let me back up a second, uh, take a little side trip. You know, I, I watched a film the uh, a few months ago on Disney animation, the history of Disney animation, particularly focusing on the the second rise of uh, the second golden era, so to speak, of, of Disney animation with films like Beauty and the Beast and and Aladdin and Lion King. And there's a scene in the movie where where Michael Eisner um, is talking about how his life is and how wonderful essentially it is at that moment in time. And he says, you know, if I could have one wish, it would be that I'm um, paraphrasing here, that nothing would change from the way it is now. I like my kids the age they are. I like the age I am. I like my wife. I like the relationship we're having right now. I like how well Disney is doing. I like the movies that we've uh, that we've come out with. You know, if if things could just stay like this until the day I die, it would be great. And and you know, it occurs to me that I think that sort of thing is a risk that can happen to companies as well. And I'm not saying it's happening at Apple by any means, but I mean, it's something to think about. That you get to a point where everything is wonderful. You know, you get, and in the case of Apple, and this is where it comes with the time, and you get to a point where the iPhone is the hottest product on the, on, the, on, the, on the planet, and the iPad has come out and it's doing gangbusters because there's no competition. There isn't a second best tablet that's like the iPad, there's just nothing. The iPad essentially commands 100% of the market. And the, 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 I, you know, the iTunes store is doing gangbusters, and the Macs are increasing their market share, and the Mac laptops are the most popular laptops around. And you just say, and I could see someone at Apple saying, essentially, a little like Michael Eisner, everything is wonderful now, if only we could keep it that way. And that is a is a not a good attitude, in my view, for innovation, because essentially one way to view that statement is to say that if we just keep, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to improve our products in any great way? Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to come out with great new products? Wouldn't it be nice if the iPad could just stay the, the dominant pro, uh, tablet on the market and the iPhone could just stay the most wonderful thing on the planet without us having to exert much effort to do so? Uh, and... Um, and you wind up uh, in companies that, that 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 start feeling that way wind up trying to protect their turf, so to speak, wind up trying to to keep their market share with that product that they have and 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 hoping that something doesn't come along to out innovate them as opposed to out innovating themselves and cannibalizing themselves if necessary uh, and so I think that's a danger when you're that successful that you just say i'm so successful that i'm against change." because any change is likely to be for the worse, because how can things get better than they are now? Uh, and that's dangerous. And I don't think Apple is is doing that by any means, but I, I think it's always something to look out for. And it does seem, it does strike me, as long as we're talking about, that Apple seems to be in a little bit of a slump, for lack of a better word. I, I mean, they... they, they it's not. It's, just, it's, a, it's been a while since any um, significant products have been announced. Not even game-changing products, but just. I mean, here we are in March, for instance, and there isn't. There hasn't been any product announcement so far this year. Um, there isn't even a, an upcoming media event that seems to be on the horizon. Uh, by this time last year, uh, there had been a new iPad that had been out. I believe the developers had received uh, developer copies of iOS 6. Um, there were already some significant rumors, as I recall, as to what um, uh, OS 10 uh, uh, 10.8 would be. Um, and and there's nothing like that so far this year. So uh, it's not to say there won't be some amazing products coming out 
between April and the rest of the year. Uh, but uh, it, it seems to be off to a slow start. And I do have occasionally some concerns as, you know, what if the year is over? I think I tweeted this the other day and people assured me I should calm down, not worry about it. Uh, what if the year is over and uh, an, I, a mi an iPad mini with a retina display and some minimally tweaked I um, iPhone 5S were the highlights of the year in terms of Apple's new products? Um, the competition is catching up. That isn't going to be good enough. Apple needs, I think, needs to, you know, needs to, st they, don't, they don't need a whole new category necessary like the iPad and the iPhone were when they came out, though that would certainly be nice if it was a successful one. But they need to, to improve the products they have in some substantial ways to stay ahead of the competition. Have some features that the other products simply don't have yet. That, that, that when you go to buy a smartphone and you're trying to decide between a Samsung and an iPhone, you say, well, I want the iPhone because the iPhone can do X and the Samsung can't do anything like that. And there are less and less features like that these days. I'm going to play devil's advocate because I, I agree with everything you've said. But I also think that there's a danger, and, and Apple's been able to avoid it to a large degree, a Microsoft Word. We mm. we have to have a new version of Microsoft Word, so we're going to put more bloat in, and and I'm sorry yeah. for the Word fans, but it's the best example I can think mm. of. Mm. You know, th features that yes, somebody you know maybe one half of one half of one percent of the market will use, and they may be implemented well or terribly, but it's something to tout. And then we're going to do a ribbon, and we're going to change the toolbars, and we're going to change this and change that, really for the sake of changing things. And that's what I've been very happy to see Apple not engage in too much, um, just change for for change sake. Usually, not at all the time. It feels like the changes are there as part of a grander scheme that we're all trying to second guess and out guess. The how many times have you and I talked about the iOSification of mm -hmm. the OS? Mm -hmm. You know, so our. Even though Tim Cook says no, that's not what we're doing, or we're really not looking in that area. You and I are sitting here saying, well. Sh Sure does look that way. So, mm -hmm. I, I guess I I'm not as dissatisfied with with, with the pace of things. Maybe because it's nice to have my credit card cool off for a little while, but at some point I I just don't want to see change for change's sake. I want real features, and if there are no real features right now to have, then don't pretend that they're real features like like some hardware and software companies do. Oh, I, I, you're not playing devil's advocate there, as far as I'm concerned. I, I totally agree with you. I, to come out with the equivalent of redesigning the, the, the toolbar is not going to be something that's going to sell more iPhones. Uh, and I, change for change's sake is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some honest-to-goodness new worthwhile features. And if you can't come up with those, then you know don't do change for change's sake. I agree with you. But there is a sense in which... Again, the, I feel like the I, the competition is catching up. There's no doubt about it. The tablets today are better than the tablets were. The non-Apple ones are better than they were a couple of years ago. And Samsung's uh, smartphones are getting some rave reviews. And people from Guy Kawasaki on down are arguing that in some sense they might even be better than the, than the iPhone. And so Apple has to be feeling some of that heat. They can't be content to say... Our iPhone, you know, right now is is fantastic, and and we're not going to just do chains for chain's sake, which I don't want them to do, and so we're just going to keep making the same iPhone. Uh, and in fact, I'm not even it's not even clear to me that that Apple should limit itself anymore to one major new upgrade per year for these products. You know, this year it's the iPhone. Five, then it's the iPhone 5S, then the iPhone 6, and they come out a pace of one per year. Uh, I, I'd be actually in favor of Apple considering coming out with with upgrades more often, uh, as 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 they as they make sense. Again, not, don't come out every time there's some minor change to your to your phone it doesn't require a major upgrade, but but twice a year even wouldn't be out of hand for some of these products. Apple was sort of moving in that direction with the iPad last year, where they came out with the iPad 4 together with the iPad mini at the end of last year. And I thought that worked kind of well. I, I could see where it be, could be useful to come out with an iPad update twice a year. It gives, it gives them more flexibility. It gives them more ability to react. You know, it, what, if, what if Apple comes out with the iPad 5, and then the next day, say, some other company, Samsung, say, comes out with a great new feature that you want to have in your iPad? Now you have to wait a whole year under traditional 
plan before there's any hope that you're going to get that in the iPad. Uh, and you have to watch watch while Samsung gains market share for a whole year because they have this great new feature that the iPad doesn't have. Well, you know, maybe Apple needs to start thinking about if that something like that happens, they have to react more quickly than that. Agreed. Agreed. And in that situation, I would absolutely agree with the refresh mm. in two or three months. The, the iPhone, we had this discussion, the iPhone is mm. a little bit different animal because we're mm. all locked in to these contracts. Mm-hmm. And, and if there's one thing I'd like, I'd like to see, I'd love to see Apple throw a little bit of its muscle around. And even if you knock it down to a one-year contract or you guarantee me an upgrade fee that, that is not a full-blown subsidy, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. is, that that would be that would be, in my opinion, very very good because I know plenty mm-hmm. of people who hesitate. They 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 have been up to this point switching every other iPhone because they're waiting for their contract to be up, mm-hmm. and the carriers haven't always given the subsidized or even a partially subsidized price. And so, you know, people end up jumping carriers, too, which is mm-hmm. a pain. Well, my, my solution to that, which has worked great, is to have a um, partner, a spouse, whatever, uh, that is content to have last year's phone. And, and so what we do, you know, Naomi is, is happy to have the phone that I had for the previous year. So I get a new phone every year. I get, and I give, her, I give her last year's phone. And, we, and since we're, getting, we're only getting one new phone per year, and there's two phones, Every time we get a new phone, it's a it's a two year contract change, and so we can get the discounted price. And it's, it's a beautiful system, but it requires somebody else to participate with you to, for that to work. You aren't suggesting I'm getting that I get married, are you, Dad? No, not Good. not in your case. No. Good. Good. It, it's it's actually cheaper to just buy a a, 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 a new phone every year. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. For a second there, you scared mm-hmm. me. I thought this mm-hmm. could this could be the end of your appearances mm-hmm. here. <laughs> uh, well, one thing's for sure: we're. I don't think Apple's going to rest on its laurels. I mean, mm-hmm. they, that's just not in the DNA of the company. We both know people that work there. That's not the way that that Jobs built the company, and it's not the way that the organization functions. It's just a matter of wondering when they will bring out and what they will bring out that we won't be able to keep our hands off of. I agree, but I like. I guess I'm just feeling a little nervous that I want the the ball to start rolling at this point. I'm I'm anxious to get this year's product line moving, and not worry about when the first media event is going to be anymore. Right. And I'd also like to see it have a positive effect on their stock, given that I own some Apple stock. I'd, I'd like to see it head back up towards 500 instead of down towards 300. Uh, you and me both. But mm-hmm. again, we've had that conversation. Mm-hmm. It, it seems to be going the wrong direction for no real good reason. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you look at the, look at the sales and the numbers and everything that Wall Street <laughs> yeah. traditionally looks at, yeah, I'm also could go up for no good reason too. I'll be happy with that. Okay, right. <laughs> I'll get I'll get right on that. <laughs> okay, Ted, thank you so much for the time. It's always fun. Okay, yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to talk to you, Chuck, and I'll look forward to it next time too. Same here. Same here. Ah. <laughs> And we save the best for last. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what, what, what would be a, a, a call without this? Uh, that's right. Okay. Well, uh, right. I'll, I'll get that, and I'll speak to you later. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Folks, we'll be back with more from uh, from Mac Notables on Mac Voices. I'm Chuck Joyner. He's Ted Landau. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.